2016 vaccines. It's organized by the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, the Biotechnology Innovation organization and the developing countries vaccine manufacturers network my name is claire dool and i'm your moderator journalists from now that's 1300 central european time and 7 a.m eastern time please start putting your questions in the chat box do include who you are your outlet and your question and if you want somebody specifically to answer that question, please do say who. We're going to be taking those questions in the second part of this briefing after our speakers have set the scene. And the speakers today are Roger Connor, President, Global Vaccines, GlaxoSmithKline and Vaccine CEO Representative on COVAX. Stéphane Boncel, Chief Executive Officer, Moderna. Sai Prasad, Executive Director, Quality Operations, Bharat Biotech, and President of Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturers Network. We also have Rajinda Suri, CEO of the Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturers Network, Dr. Michelle McCamari Heath, President and CEO of Biotechnology Innovation Organization, and Thomas Kueni, Director General of the IFPMA. To begin, Thomas, a few words just to say to us why today's briefing is so important at this particular moment in time. Thank you very much, Claire. We have a few reasons why we hosted this media briefing today. The first one is today marks the first anniversary of the ACT A partnership, Access to COVID 19 Tools, accelerated the partnership, uh, which WHO co-convened with organizations such as CEPI, Gavi, and many others, including the industry. The second reason is it's time to take stock and look at how far did we come in a year. We have seen the most uh, rapid vaccine development ever. In 326 days, the first vaccine against COVID-19 was approved. And we also have seen the fastest rollout of vaccines ever. Actually, vaccines in less than 100 days after the approval by WHO, reaching almost every country in the world, 177 all over. But we have also actually reason to remind ourselves that we wouldn't be where we are without the unprecedented collaboration. Actually, already in March 2020, we said we will only be able to push back the pandemic through collaborations, through helping each other. And we have seen this reflected now in the media briefing. First time, representatives from the DCVMN, Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers, Bio, and IFPMA, basically the big pharma companies. And we have seen a willingness to be together, but I think it's also time to remind ourselves of the challenges ahead, to caution about the bottlenecks, and to remind ourselves we can't afford to leave a stone unturned if we want to vaccinate the world. The World Bank in a recent report said that if vaccine uh, capacity objectives are met this year, almost 10 billion doses, the world can be vaccinated and the world is the world by spring next year reaching herd immunity. That's what we have come here to talk about. Thank you very, very much, uh, Thomas. And let me start immediately with the uh, manufacturers. And if I go to uh, Roger Connor from uh, GSK. Roger, so it used to take years, uh, many years, to produce uh, vaccines and not months. Uh, can you quickly explain how GSK has uh, responded? And very importantly, what are you doing to scale up production? I think, Claire, this question around how the industry has managed to move so fast is one that, that I take all the time. Uh, the way I look at it, first of all, the most important thing is that we're still applying all the same standards that we do whenever we develop any vaccine. We want to make sure that it is safe and it meets efficacy uh, 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 levels as, as well. But what's allowed us to move so quickly this time, really, I think there's four things. First one I'd focus on is, is science. 
the work that was done in advance on COVID, the COVID family of vaccines, post-SARS, for example, really helped the identification of the spike protein early. So that shouldn't be underestimated. Also, we know new technologies have, have been proven and allowed us to get into the, the clinic super fast. So the mRNA vaccines that have come along and, and been proven, I, I, I think, uh, have been a real game changer in terms of the timeline to get into, uh, into the clinic. Then secondly, I think focus, both whether that's governments, whether that is companies, there's been complete focus and resources made available to make this priority number one. In particular, the regulators working hand in hand, almost day by day with the, with the vaccine manufacturers to make sure that that goes at, as fast and as appropriately as possible. Third is, is manufacturing at risk, getting uh, keeping things moving in parallel rather than going in series. So in other words, actually taking a decision what dose or what product you think will work and make it now, assuming the trial will work. And if it doesn't work, we'd have to throw it away. But if it does work, you've got the product in the cupboard and ready to go. So that manufacturing at risk has been important. And then finally, collaboration. I think this is a, a, a theme that will come out through this event is that the, uh, the collaboration across the industry that I have seen for COVID-19, I have never seen it in my 20 years in this industry. It is incredible what has happened between academia and companies where you see AZ and Oxford coming together and big companies who are typically uh, very competitive like Sanofi and GSK coming together and trying to do the right thing to make sure this works. So those are probably the, the priorities. What I would say on scale up is that it's not easy making vaccines. I used to run global manufacturing for GSK before I moved into the vaccines role, and these are difficult products to make. So we should expect some bumps along the road, given that complexity, as each of the vaccines develop scales up. And uh, I'm sure we'll uh, look at those bumps in the road and how they can be overdressed. Um, let me just uh, also pick up on the fact that, uh, Roger, of course, you've got two hats. Uh, you're also uh, the uh, CEO, EO vaccine representative on COVAX. So just tell us very briefly about that, how the CEOs have been engaging and what sort of challenges do you think looking ahead are going to have to be addressed collectively? Yeah, well, well, I, I uh, this year chair a group of vaccine CEOs at the IFPMA pool together and this is an incredibly powerful group with many working on on covid vaccines and as that in that role i then sit and represent that team in in covax as a group of vaccine ceos we now get together every two weeks to try and find ways that we can collaborate to make sure that we all uh we all create as many doses as we can to impact as many lives as we as we can. What I would say is we have to congratulate the COVAX initiative and team for what's been achieved so far. Greater than 40 million doses going to a very high number of countries already. A good start, but I think more to be done. So a couple of themes that as a, as a team of vaccine CEOs we're looking at, we're continuing to look for partnerships. So there's already been a very high number of partnerships developed across the industry. However, we wanna make sure that we, we make the connections between suppliers and companies where those bottlenecks are currently and ensuring that we look to, to share wherever possible. In, in GSK, for example, we've been, uh, if we've had a backlog of our a, a stock build of glass files, we'll make it available to somebody who needs it more. If there's an opportunity for one company to make their capacity available to another, we will do exactly that. So I think this collaboration is something we're very focused on. To get quite specific, the, the recently announced COVID manufacturing task force on COVID, we believe is really important. It's all about the free flow of goods and ensuring that the, any bottlenecks or any constraints that's, that, that cause a constriction in the supply chain are removed. We have to remember these are very complicated products. You don't just press one button and a new vial comes out. If only it was like that, there are, there are hundreds of components and it only takes one of them to be constrained or stopped flowing that, that it can bring the supply of the overall vaccine to a halt. So as a team, we are very keen to get behind the, the proposals from that task force, which are to continue to look for, for collaboration, ensuring the free flow of goods and getting ahead of those bottlenecks, monitoring supply and demand, and looking to see where the next one is coming and, and act on it now, rather than reacting to it as well.
Yeah, so that's a message that's coming out very uh, strongly that you want to be part of that COVAX manufacturing task force and indeed getting ahead, as you say, of the supply uh, potential glitches or uh, bottlenecks. Let me bring in uh, somebody else who's also uh, developing and producing a vaccine. Uh, Sai, your executive director, uh, quality operations of Bharat Biotech, and I believe that you've been uh, developing and producing uh, India's first indigenous COVID-19 uh, vaccine, uh, co-vaccine. You've also got another he uh, hat, uh, president of the Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturers Network, and you've got 40 members or more of that network, including the Serum Institute, which is the world's biggest uh, vaccine manufacturer. So let me ask you how or perhaps why has it been possible for developing country vaccine uh, makers uh, like Barrett to become such important players in innovating and scaling up? Sure, thank you. Um, I think uh, the, int the simple reason is there is knowledge and information and capabilities and expertise that's already available. I mean, this cannot be built overnight. It, it has taken decades to, you know, for companies to come to this situation and or this position. So with this knowledge and expertise, I think companies are able to leverage their technologies that they know uh, already, whether that might be new platform technologies, for example, like in CanSino Bio, uh, using an adenoviral vector platform or uh, some of us, uh, you know, Sinovac and Sinopharm and us using, you know, a whole virion uh, inactivated approach, because these are uh, manufacturing processes, QC, QA processes that we are very comfortable with. Uh, we know how it works. Uh, safety is beyond a reasonable doubt. And when we think about responding to a pandemic, um, you know, this is the first things that come to mind. And, you know, let's face it, we're all vaccinologists. We're vaccine developers and manufacturers. At this point in time, if we don't rise up to the challenge and make vaccines available, uh, whether that is manufacturing or innovation, I think uh, you know we're not we will not be good citizens in the industry, or I guess, or in, in for science. I think that's an important part. I mean, I you know I agree with uh, Roger and Thomas. I mean, I think we need to give a shout out to Gavi Kovacs for the work that they have done, and also to the Act WHO Act Accelerator Tools, because they have made sure that you know, global organizations have all come to one place and we're all discussing the, you know, the serious issues that are impeding um, product development and vaccinology and making vaccines readily accessible and available. There's been a lot of talk, and in fact, there is still a lot of talk about technology transfer. Very, very quickly, yeah. how, how do you see that working? I, I think technology transfer is, um, you know, uh, it's a very, very important uh, tool that we need to encourage. But I think what we need to ask is, you know, we need to first match innovators and manufacturers. Uh, technology transfers cannot be done with an entity that has no experience in making vaccines and biologics. It has to be uh, companies with prior knowledge and expertise in making uh, these vaccines. Like Roger mentioned, I mean, it's hundreds uh, you know, for, for example, in our company, you know, some of the vaccines take 150 to 200 little components from different parts of the world that are coming in, and we need to manage all of that. And uh, so this cannot be transferred over a three month or a six month or a one year period. This is going to take a long time. So I think as a community, as industry, we need to encourage these partnerships between innovators and um, vaccine manufacturers. And I've been saying this all along. I think we need to be agnostic to where these companies are, US, Europe, India, China, Brazil, for example. But we need to make sure that these companies come together and start making vaccines. And I think there is a good track record of that. Uh, there are more than you know, uh, 200 or 250 partnerships that have already taken place between both IFPMA companies, DCVMN companies, maybe you know, companies that are part of bio also. And I think we just need to keep um, uh, encouraging this, you know, more and more. And we ourselves, you know, we are a small company, but we're looking at partnerships. We're already working on a tech transfer partnership in India with another uh, company. Uh, we're looking at fill finish partnerships with two other partners in India. We're also transferring our own technology to a company in the United States. And we're also looking at other companies like Brazil, 
and other Asian countries. So this is a this is an ongoing and a evolving process. But vaccines are a complex space. Uh, that's why if you look at the entire pharmaceutical industry, maybe you have tens of thousands of companies. Uh, the number of vaccine companies you can probably count, uh, you know, in double digits, because this is a very complex space, very complicated science. Manufacturing is very complicated. So I think we need to be careful whom we are transferring technology to, whether they can receive it well and whether they can manufacture well. And as you say, it is incredibly complex. So there are uh, supply chain challenges. Can you very briefly give us a few examples of those? Supply chain challenges, yes. Um, I mean, we've had reports from uh, the Serum Institute of India um, having problems with certain single use uh, materials that uh, is supposed to come from the United States, for example, this has been spoken about in the media. There were also other challenges for shipping of clinical materials to different parts of the world and also QC reagents and you know plastic bags, for example, which we think is a mundane consumable uh, because maybe a decade ago, industry as such, we were all thinking about going into single use uh, systems which involved a lot of single-use consumables. So now this, ha unfortunately, has become an impediment and a bottleneck. Uh, we have not seen this impediment in terms of the routine, you know, the medias, the buffers, the glass vials, the rubber stoppers, and things like that, which we have enough of. But these are these unique uh, single-use plastics and filters, and, um, you know, these kinds of uh, items are becoming a problem. And they will continue to remain a problem. I don't think we have a solution in sight. Um, you know, the United States has the DPA and, um, you know, if there is something that would help a U.S. manufacturer, they've always, already been on record stating that, that they will hold it back. So I think these are issues that industries and companies and countries have to work together. Yes, and I'm sure we'll be getting some media questions about the yes. uh, U.S. Defense Protection Act. Let me, though, bring yes. in uh, Stefan. Uh, Moderna, it's a company that's new to the commercialization of vaccines. So how have you adjusted to the need to produce and deliver hundreds of millions of doses uh, this year? Yes, yeah, indeed. Moderna last year, when we started chasing the virus, was a company with 800 people. Uh, only U.S. operation. We never done a phase three, never launched a product. And I would say a few things explain what we have been able to do and we are doing this year. I think first, the mRNA technology is really uh, quite uh, disruptive in terms of speed, as we saw last year, in terms of scalability for manufacturing. You know, this is a cell-free manufacturing process. So it's much more scalable then let's say uh, a, a recombinant protein or adenovirus uh, because we don't use any cells in a manufacturing process. The, the second reason that explained why we could go so fast is this was not our first vaccine. We had actually put 10 vaccines in the clinic. We had been able to improve the amount of molecule chemistry. We have been able to improve over the years the lipid that we put around it. Uh, and also the manufacturing process, we are right now at our sixth generation of manufacturing process since we've been in the clinic with those vaccines. I think the dedication of a team and people like in my colleagues, I've been working seven days a week now for you know 15 months because we know every day matters, every hour matters. As Roger said, I think an incredible collaboration with first the regulators. Uh, I think we should all feel very proud about the teams at the FDA, MHI, EMA, and all the regulatory agencies in terms of a dialogue very quick uh, feedback loop guidelines that have been very useful to industry. And then the, all the industrial partners, because while a lot of people in the world are getting the Moderna vaccine injected in their arms, uh, it's actually a huge team effort. You know, PPD has helped us to do the clinical trial for a phase three. Lonza is helping us to make the product. You know, Catalan, Baxter, Rovi are all companies helping us fill the valves and we are doing more tech transfer as we speak to increase the capacity. Uh, and then, of course, capital. I mean, the U.S. government was very helpful by giving us a billion dollar grant. So basically, when we filed to WHO or to any country, the clinical data were basically uh, funded by U.S. taxpayer. And also when early last year in the spring, we could not find governments willing to help us by uh, not finding any foundation willing to help us. We actually went to the capital market and raised you know, $1.3 billion so that we could buy raw material, buy machines, 
because as my colleagues have described, it's a very complex manufacturing process and started to hire literally hundreds of people to, to make the vaccine. Uh, we are on, on track to make up to a billion dollars this year. And next year with the capacity we added, again, we announced, uh, I think a month or two ago, we're on track to have potentially up to $1.4 billion for 2022. Well, that's uh, certainly good news. What would you say has been the biggest lesson learned uh, for you and for Moderna over the past year? I think it's to stay very agile uh, because uh, we are fighting a virus which is not standing still. If you were to ask me my biggest worry, Claire, it's the variants. Uh, as we know, and that has been reported, uh, the antibody is decreasing over time. Uh, as, as expected, this is vaccinology. Um, and if you think about the variants that are emerging, you know, the one first identified in the UK, Brazil, South Africa, now we, we're hearing about the double, you know, mutant or variant in India. Uh, they are more appearing everywhere. I worry deeply about the next six months because as we know, the southern hemisphere is going into its fall and winter. Uh, when it's colder, people spend more time indoor. It's a respiratory virus. As we've seen in the northern hemisphere the last six months, I've been uh, really horrific in terms of what happened, you know, uh, across across uh, the northern hemisphere. And so I worry, especially with uh, such a large population, a very large immunocompromised population, a lot of people that unfortunately are HIV positive. I worry deeply uh, on the guidance of my epidemiologist that we should be seeing many more mute, uh, variants. What Moderna is doing, we already are in the clinic with different strategy of variants, including a, a, a multivalent product, a product with two mRNA, the original mRNA, and the new one, which is 100% copy of a genetic sequence of a B1351, uh, the variant first identified in South Africa. Uh, the preclinical data looks very encouraging. We should get the clinical data as early as May because it's a single dose boost. And we're working very hard to potentially have late summer, early fall, that boost for the variant authorized to be able to be used in the marketplace for boosting people. And that's why we're even looking at potentially increasing more capacity for next year, because I really think getting quick action on variants is going to be key. Uh, and uh, I really believe mRNA technology is the one that can go the fastest. And we have a huge role and uh, responsibility to society to keep moving very fast. So we, we stay very close to the virus change and not five steps behind. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Quick action on all of those uh, variants that we're hearing about. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Let me now move to some of the associations which are representing uh, vaccine uh, makers. Uh, Rajinda, you're CEO of the Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturers Network. Um, as I said, you've got uh, more than 40 members, the Serum Institute, you're based in 14 countries. So what are the biggest bottlenecks that your members are facing? Thank you, Claire, uh, for using a very appropriate expression, I would say the bottlenecks, because if you had asked me the challenges, uh, I would have said that all the challenges that we had uh, anticipated or foreseen at that time, uh, when the gene sequencing was made available to us, for example, the facility related manpower related, the technical uh, technologies uh, involved, all those have been surmounted by the vaccine industry in the last uh, uh, 13, 14 months. And now uh, I think what is important is that I must add here that we have not lost any opportunity or missed any opportunity to collaborate and to fast track the development and manufacturing of high quality affordable vaccines. Having said that, I must say that uh, today, you know, when uh, uh, we are at a verge of expanding and ramping up the capacities uh, which are really required to meet the global demand, we are certainly facing uh, some of the bottlenecks. And uh, both my colleagues, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Sai Prasad and uh, uh, Stefan have already uh, hinted and listed some of these bottlenecks Particularly, I would say at this uh, stage, uh, you know, it is the shortage of critical input materials, which is becoming a real bottleneck. And that uh, when I'm saying uh, critical materials, you know, 
you know there are two parts there is a drug substance and then there is a drug product and in the drug substance you have the upstream the downstream the purification part so uh, at this is a complete chain of manufacturing and there are materials which are you know like uh, single use uh, components like cell culture medium serums adjuvants filters single use plastic bags tubing and bioreactors so the important thing is that this is a complete chain so if any one of the component is missing or some of these components are missing the entire chain comes to a grinding halt and that is what is going to be a biggest bottleneck if it is not resolved now the the problem is that most of these materials are coming from us and you know that uh, mr sai mentioned that in us you have uh, what is called the defense production act the dpa uh, you know it is being talked about everywhere today now the issue is if this uh, uh, dpa is not tackled with or handled properly effectively then the supply chain will get impacted and in turn the capacities that we are talking about building the global capacities will adversely get impacted so i think this is one of the biggest challenge that we have today in terms of uh, the manufacturing uh, uh, and the supply chain and uh, second of course when you are ramping up the capacities uh, you know because this is not small facilities that are going to generate the capacity that you are talking about so if we are ramping up the capacities you require huge sustained funding and investments and this is one challenge especially i am talking from uh, you know the developing country vaccine manufacturers uh, point of view that this is uh, where you know the second uh, uh, issue is it is being handled it is being tackled i would say uh, being supported by governments also in various countries uh, including india and china and uh, of course brazil uh, but also the, the, it would require a sustained amount of funding and therefore a lot of efforts from uh, global agencies would be required to make sure that uh, ramping up is uh, smooth the third think, thing yes yeah. sorry rajinder I, oh, i'll just touch i'll just touch uh, of course uh, stefan has already handled is in terms of variants so i think this is the third challenge which uh, of course all global agencies together are addressing this very seriously thank you thank you very much rajinda let me now then bring into the conversation dr michel mccurry heath who's president and ceo of biotechnology innovation organization uh, which uh, i read was the world's largest trade association represent Representing biotechnology companies, academic institutions, and many others in the U.S. and in 30 other countries. So, Michelle, tell us a little bit about biotech, small and mid-sized companies. How are they responding to the challenges of scaling up manufacturing capacity? The response has been historic and just inspiring. Over the last 14 months, globally, biotechnology companies have produced over 900 research and development programs targeted at combating COVID, over 200 of which were vaccines. And they have partnered in many ways that you've heard about already on this panel today. Those partnerships, that incredible attention and focus of the science has led us to unprecedented um, advances and in record time. But let's not lose in the final, in the final step, in the final stages. We all need and want to get vaccine to everyone who needs it around the globe. It is a public health and humanitarian imperative, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize um, the fragile partnerships and, um, and manufacturing relationships that have already been established. We need to focus on great efforts like COVAX, which are just beginning to fully ramp up and can deliver very affordable vaccines around the globe. And we need to make sure that we are not stemming the tide of much needed uh, raw materials and, um, and technical capacity around the world. So this is very, very critically important. Yeah, I mean, we, we're hearing a lot about the DPA. So I'm just wondering from a US perspective where you sit, I mean, how do you think the world should be addressing and really overcoming some of these supply chain challenges? Yes, Claire, it's very, very important to address. Let's face it, the new US administration was really trying to um, compensate 
for the withdrawal from the global stage of the previous administration. They took some very positive steps, re-engaging with the WHO, recommitting to COVAX, delivering on some of their financial com um, commitments to COVAX. All of this is very, very important. But the Defense Protection Act, which was really designed to um, withhold um, capacity and expertise and doses and raw materials to the US um, customer base um, was well-intentioned, but somewhat misguided at this stage. We need to get those raw materials out to the limited manufacturing capacity that exists around the globe. And now is the time to act on this. The rate limiting step is not intellectual property. The rate limiting step is manufacturing know-how and capacity. And we need to make sure that in every corner of the world that has this great capacity and where those partnerships are already in place with our great innovators, that they have the ability and the means to manufacture as many doses as possible. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, before we take the many journalist questions that are coming in, I'd like to bring in uh, Thomas, Director General of the IFPMA. Thomas, in your opening remarks, you were mentioning that it's the first anniversary of the Act A, the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. Um, what's been achieved and how has the industry uh, con contributed? And Thomas, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Claire, I think we said a year ago, we do feel a deep sense of responsibility because when you look at what has the industry brought to Act A, it is actually the industry, it is manufacturers such as Stefan, Sai, Rachel, developing and manufacturing those vaccines, but also COVID-19 treatments. And there the industry, I think, has exceeded all expectations. Not many people would have believed it a year ago that we would have not one, but several vaccines reaching people within less than a year. In particular, the biotech companies have excelled with the game-changing mRNA technologies. And I think we are all tremendously grateful for that. At the same time, we also have to acknowledge that we aren't quite there yet. I think we see that many people have underestimated the complexity of vaccine manufacturing, the complexity of scaling up. We heard from Stefan how Moderna really was challenged to move from producing vaccines for clinical trials to hopefully reaching a billion doses this year. That is a daunting challenge and every other company, we have seen some projects failing. But what we now see is trebling, you know, from pre-COVID-19, 5 billion doses for all vaccines together to 10 billion doses this year for just COVID-19. That is really challenging. And we called out together with our colleagues from DCVMN and Bio and reached out to CEPI earlier this year and co-convened a global C19 vaccine supply chain and manufacturing summit because we realize we do have problems in terms of bottlenecks of raw materials of ingredients. We do run into roadblocks because of export restrictions or need for permits. We need trade acceleration there. And we also have seen actually the importance of the skilled workers you need. You heard from Zai, for example, Stefan, Roger, all of them, vaccine manufacturer really needs experience, seasoned worker, it needs decades of experience. And we have shortages there. And that's why we did co-convene this summit. And we are now part of the COVAX manufacturing task force, which has grown up of that. And we do call out to countries as well as to WTO to help us address the bottlenecks in terms of trade. We do actually uh, commit to being part of a visibility enhancement marketplace because it's obvious, and you heard it from Rachel, one company has too many glass vials because their vaccine hasn't come uh, to, to market approval yet. Therefore, if you do have a matchmaking, I think we can increase the efficiency. And we also need, in addition to free flow of goods, and, uh, and, and people, we do need also to engage in these partnerships. 275 partnerships have been signed just on vaccines, including 214 involving tech transfer. I wouldn't have thought four months ago to see quite a few of those 
amazing new partnerships. I would be extremely surprised if we wouldn't see more. That's why companies are also willing to commit to tech transfer. And I think that's one of the elements we are really, really committed to leaving no stone unturned to vaccinate the world and improve on vaccine equity. And very, very uh, quickly, uh, Thomas, if steps are not taken uh, to address these bottlenecks, what will that mean? You know, to be very frank, we would fail the world because until everyone is safe, no one is safe. And when I look at, you know, the best scenario this year would be about 14 billion doses of vaccine manufacturing. Now, we have seen just over the last few months, uh, everything doesn't always go uh, smooth. We have seen bumps and glitches. Therefore, I think a realistic chance is to reach the 10 billion, which the World Bank estimates by March next year, we could reach herd immunity. But if we don't, we may have a few doses. And I think we would really be challenged to fulfill our promises, not just to people in our countries, many of them also still waiting for vaccination, but in particular to people in developing countries. Yeah. We Thank can't you. afford to fail. Thank you very, very much to our speakers. Now let me hand over to the journalists. Uh, a first question, which is from Associated Press. Uh, Reginda, if you would like to go first and then Roger, the question is the following. What have been the worst supply shortages? I know that we've had mention of some of them, but we're looking now for the worst ones affecting production of COVID-19 vaccines and medicines, are they easing yet or do you expect that to happen soon? Reginda. Thank you, Claire. Uh, uh, in fact, as I just mentioned a few moments back, uh, you know, it is uh, largely, uh, again, the single use components which are the major bottleneck and not uh, many other things because the facilities are already there. Uh, people are already there, so these are not challenges anymore. Uh, however, and, and these I am talking about the companies who are regularly manufacturing vaccines. So uh, ultimately, it is boiling down. And, and if you see the impact, for example, if a company is manufacturing 1 billion doses a year, or it has a potential to manufacture 1 billion doses, and you do not supply the material for one month, 100 million doses are gone and these 100 million can have a tremendous impact on maybe 100 countries. So that is the kind of impact that we are talking about and that is why it is all the more important that this should be addressed very quickly. Roger, your take on the question. Yeah, I completely agree with Rajinder. I, I, I think at the moment we're focused in on, it's called the components, the elements that we need to manufacture the next batch. And there are some bottlenecks. There, there are a couple of other things that I think that we have to stay completely focused on and are causing challenges at the moment. The first one is we throw out this term tech transfer. It sounds very easy, just teach somebody else to do it. But as, as Sai said, and, and everybody on this call, we've all been through many tech transfers in our careers and they are difficult. You, this is not just teaching a team to do a process, but transferring the process into new equipment. Does it behave the same? Does it scale up and behave the same? Because these are complex systems and we have to ensure that, that they meet all of the quality standards. So those tech transfers are complex. And that's some of the disruption that we're seeing is multiple new suppliers come online. They're not reaching the capacity that they expected. That needs technical support. That needs technical investigation. We will solve it, but it's not to be, uh, it's, it's to be expected at this stage. The other bottleneck that we can really hit is, is skill the labor and the experience required. We're all operating, making products which are sterile. That, that means that they have to be made to the highest standard without a single bug being anywhere near it because this is being injected into the body. So sterile experience, sterile understanding and process understanding, that is not something that you can suddenly just retrain overnight. Anybody going into a new vaccine facility has to be trained and has to be certified, which takes weeks. So again, there isn't a quick fix in these, but what really helps is the collaboration between all of the people you see in this call. And then of the groups that we represent just want to do the right thing. And when, when we are a small enough community, when a phone call comes in and says, Roger, can we help? Or Stefan, can we help? I, we do. And I think that's one big uh, 
thing that we can do is continue to encourage that collaboration. And if there are mechanisms that formalize it more like Thomas described, we should just grab it. Thank you, Roger. Now we are getting a lot of questions on intellectual uh, property. I'm just gonna read out the outlets. The Economic Times newspaper, Radio France, RFI, L'Echo in Belgium, uh, the German national broadcaster, ARD, uh, the Mail and Guardian in South Africa, and Switzerland's TAM Media. So uh, let me put a question uh, to uh, Sai um, from the Economic Times newspaper. Countries such as India and South Africa have moved to the WTO asking for a waiver of COVID vaccine IP. What's your view, Sai? Sure, sure. I think not just India and South Africa, and I think several other countries have, uh, you know, signed up for this, uh, you know, for this request too. I think what we need to look at, we need to take a step back and look at the big picture. I mean, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to accomplish that during this pandemic, vaccines and healthcare solutions, therapeutics, diagnostics, etc., are readily available at a scale that can reach all the populations that you know that need it. So, how do we make that happen? You know, we can make it happen by, uh, you know, uh, providing intellectual property. We can make that happen by uh, doing a technology transfer, or we can make that happen by n number of ways. But we need to look at our pathways to success. You know, if we need to make sure that whatever it is that we are providing, it needs to be manufactured at the same quality standards, at the same safety standards, etc., so that needs a lot of training, that needs a lot of handholding, that needs um, what Roger mentioned as technology transfer. It's a simple word, but it, it has hundreds and hundreds of components. So even for a small company like us, if we have to transfer our technology to another entity, you know, we, we have a simple 50 or a 60 point checklist to see what kind of knowledge and expertise and facilities and capabilities people uh, the receiving company has. Based on that, we can decide whether we can uh, transfer technology or not. If the receiving company is unable to comprehend our technology or unable to understand how to manufacture the way we do, then we ourselves would be wasting time transferring that technology to that entity. Not only would our own production schemes get impacted, because these are the same people that are in production that have to go in and handhold and teach another production person somewhere else in the world. So I think these are the complexities. You know, do we take people from our company who are manufacturing product to do tech transfer, or um, you know, do we look for uh, you know people that is that already have existing experience? So I think we as a company, and also I think many DCVMs have done that. There has been technology transfer partnerships between China and Indonesia and um, Brazil, for example. As I mentioned, we ourselves are looking at. United States and other parts of the world for technology transfers and within India also. So we've been very selective. We're looking for partners who have experience and we're willing to uh, transfer technology. And we don't, you know, the concept of intellectual property, I think it's a simple term. Everybody speaks about it, but vaccine manufacturing is not just in the patents. I mean, we have 150 patents as a company. It'll all fit in a pen drive. And if I give that pen drive to somebody, I don't think they would be able to do anything about it because they need the know-how, they need the expertise, they need the trade secrets sometimes uh, that we use to manufacture vaccines. All of these are required in a package um, for to scale up and increase vaccine manufacturing. Thank, Thank you, you. Sai. Yes, vaccine uh, manufacturing, is, as you are saying, is uh, uh, not just about IP. Um, Stefan, a lot of interest also uh, to hear from you from Radio France and uh, RFI. Uh, how does Moderna see the TRIPS waiver uh, proposal at the uh, WTO? And do you understand the move made by India, South Africa, uh, and hundreds of Nobel uh, Prize laureates and former heads of state who are supporting uh, the proposal for a waiver? Yeah, I think it goes back to what Sai said, and I think he was very articulate about it, which is, uh, first, all our IP is on the internet. You go to the US patent website and you can download all of our IP and read it, it's all out there. So the key is what is it going to solve for? Because you have tech transfer is very important. Today, our teams are working seven days a week, as I said, 
to do tech transfers to enable all of our partners. If I was to take those teams away to do other tech transfers, we will not be able to deliver the billion dollars we're trying to do this year. And because we're already at the end of April, if you think about it, as Thomas said, there's already a big ramp up of capacity happening. I will submit that by next year, there's going to be too much capacity in the world. And because of a long lead time, if let's say a new company wanted to get a tech transfer that is not on the current list of all the tech transfer we are doing as we speak, uh, they will have to get new equipment. Those equipments are not available on shelves. They need to be custom made. It takes months. Then they need to be shipped into whoever buys them. And they need to be qualified because as this is a regulated process to make sure that the, the process control is very robust because this is injected in people. Those machines to be qualified, you need to get raw material supplies. As we discussed, there's already a supply constraint. So having actually more players coming into the space, taking more of the same raw materials away from people that actually to make vaccines for this year is not going to help. So I think anything we do right now, because of a long lead time and we're at the end of April, will have almost no impact in 2021. It will have impact in 2022, but what it will do, it will slow down our ability to scale up in 21 to help solve for 22, where there's going to be anyway too much capacity. So I think what we should all do is focus on delivering as many vaccines as we can this year. Next year, there's going to be way too many vaccines for people on the planet. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, Claire, can I? Can yes, I, of course. Can I Misha. jump in there as well? You know, one thread that goes through both what Stefan and Sai said is that we are in a race against the variants. We need to come up with a solution that doesn't make things worse, but actually gets us where we need to go in the fastest possible way. And trying to diffuse the limited raw materials that we have right now across many more manufacturers that perhaps don't have experience manufacturing vaccines. Could, in je could jeopardize the progress we're on track to make. This is not like transferring intellectual property in a small molecule for a drug. As a former FDA official, I can tell you biologics are a whole different order of magnitude of complexity. And we need to recognize that there are only a handful of manufacturers across the globe who have that expertise at hand. And we need to focus on getting them the materials they need to produce as many doses as, as quickly as possible and to release backlogs. The US is projected to have over 200 million excess doses in supply by the spring. We need to focus on getting those doses distributed globally um, and move forward through COVAX. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Uh, Thomas, uh, a question from Leco in Belgium. Uh, we've seen recently new calls in favor of opening the IP rights for COVID vaccines. Do you still believe that such a move could negatively affect production? I think we just heard from Sai Prasad and Stefan Boncel. Honestly, it wouldn't give you, you know, the tools to get produce more doses of vaccine because tech transfer is much more complex. It involves know-how transfer and lot. We see now tremendous willingness from companies like Barat, like Moderna, many others to share. We have heard it from, uh, from Roger by GSK. I'm not quite sure that the willingness would increase, not just to give away what you can look up at the internet, as Stefan said, but somebody comes and say, we'll take it from you, but please, you still need to give me, you know, I've used the analogy of cake. Uh, our British colleagues probably know Mary Berry. If you do uh, read the recipe of Mary Berry, it doesn't mean that you will be able to replicate the cake in the same quality. And with all due respect to Mary Berry, manufacturing a vaccine is of a different magnitude of complexity. Uh, we've got lots of questions I'm on IP, as I said before. Um, I'm going to conclude this round because there is a question from the Mail and Guardian in South Africa, uh, Reginda, and they're just asking, what is DCVMN's official position on the proposed WTO IP waiver? Uh, honestly, uh, I think Sai would be the best person to answer uh, this question. So uh, over to Sai. Sai, the official position, that's what the Mail and Guardian from South Africa is asking on the proposed sure. WTO wa waiver. Thank you. So 
see, DCVMN, we don't have an official position on this. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because we have more than 40 or 45 companies in our network. And we have all types of companies. We have companies in India, Russia, China, um, you know, Brazil, Indonesia, in South Africa also. Uh, BioVac is a member of our network. And what is it that we are trying to do? We are trying to enable partnerships between ourselves, between our own companies, and also between IFPMA companies or bio companies with our companies. So as, a, as an organization, we don't have an organizational uh, position on this purely because the membership in our, uh, in our network, they have individual positions on this. Some of them might be for it. Some of them may not be for it, and uh, and we are not able to, uh, you know, bring all of them on, you know, on a single position. I guess. On this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me ask. Um, there's a series of questions here for Stefan on Moderna's expansion plans for. Or, uh, uh, Brazil and uh, Philippines. Uh, Reginda, if you also want to comment, but let me, uh, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, Stefan, is asking, uh, will Moderna be interested in putting up a manufacturing or distribution point in the Philippines? So over time, that could be something we will entertain. I think at this stage, we're trying to focus on delivering the doses for 2021 and the variant for 2022, again, given the lead time that it takes in the industry, you know, six to nine months, if you have a clean room available to get all the work done, the distraction that this will have, as I described five minutes ago, will be limiting what we can do in 21. And so we need to be careful what we are solving for uh, in terms of uh, priorities. Our number one priority is to maximize number of those this year to help as many people as we can on the planet. And, we have uh, an agreement with the government, government of the Philippines that will be supplying from the plant in Switzerland and the filling site in Spain. Uh, Reginda, anything to say uh, to that? Yes, sure, <laughs> sure, certainly, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, a lot of collaborations have happened between the developing country vaccine manufacturers, uh, both from India and China in various parts of the world. And uh, also the MNCs like AstraZeneca has uh, come to India, they've gone to Korea, they've gone to China, they've gone to Brazil, and j, &J is coming to India and in South Africa. So, uh, you know, there is no kind of a hindrance that a particular country we should not go. Now, Africa is becoming a focus again, so why not Philippines also? I think what is important, and as uh, Stephen just said, I think the basic material has to be there. You know, the basic infrastructure has to be there. The facility has to be there. And there has to be some kind of trained manpower available. And then the tech transfers can happen quickly so, uh, so the manufacturing can take place. So if there are uh, companies who are interested in Philippines, for example, they can approach our members and we can facilitate that. If there is uh, a win-win situation, why not? Thank you very much. Uh, uh... There we are. Um, there's a question um, to Stefan uh, again. Uh, Thomas, you might want to pick up. It's from Jeune Afrique, uh, the African newspaper. Uh, is Moderna committed to uh, CTAP, the pooled access to technology against COVID-19 mechanism? If yes, how? If no, why not? So... We are really focused on working with COVAX to provide access to the vaccine. Uh, right now, given Moderna is a small company, we don't have the resources to do more tech transfer than the many ones that we are already doing as we speak to get to a billion dollars this year and 1.4 billion dollars next year. So our, our strategy as a company to get access to as many countries as we can is COVAX. We currently have done partnership with middle-income countries like the Philippines directly. We have a few more that are in discussions as we speak. Uh, we have been discussing with COVAX for quite some time. We filed to the WHO to get, uh, of course, regulatory approval, which is critical to get access across the world. And COVAX for us is the way to get maximum access around the planet of a Moderna vaccine. Thank you. Thomas, would you like to pick up on the CTAP uh, question there? I think 
I can be very short and to the point. Basically, the industry, as has been demonstrated, is fully committed to partnerships and voluntary licensing. I think the key element, and we heard it from Sai Prasad, he said they are a small company. They have a checklist of at least 50 criteria, which they need to tick the box in terms of deciding would the recipient meet those criteria. And I think one of the important elements when it comes to quality assurance, and we have heard it again and again, 70% of vaccine manufacturing is about quality control, quality assurance. And I think no company wants to give that out of their hands and without having checked themselves that the partner is apt to do it. But we have seen these partnerships, the 275 contracts, and within the COVAX uh, you know, framework, CEPI has really, really risen. Not many people knew CEPI, the Coalition on Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, a year ago. I think CEPI has really risen to the occasion. CEPI has facilitated also tech uh, transfer and partnerships. And, and for me, it is the natural body which will facilitate more partnerships because they do have established know-how on manufacturing, but companies clearly must remain in control with whom they sign up. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, we've got another question uh, for you from Politico. Uh, the WHO uh, has launched an mRNA uh, tech transfer hub. Does IFPMA think this is a good way to share know-how and technology between manufacturers? Now, there's a short and longer term answer. I think in the short term, and we have heard it from Stefan, and he might want to come in, let's not underestimate the complexity of mRNA either. You know, mRNA companies such as Moderna and many others have worked on for 30 plus years. And only last year you had the, the, the breakthrough, the game changer. At the same time, as we heard from him, it is a technology which has the potential of much easier scaling up and potentially tech transfer. But I would expect not for this pandemic in the short term. But this is something which in the context of the African Manufacturing Summit, uh, where we were both on last week, it is really for the mid and longer term in my view, but I may be wrong and might maybe much faster. I'm curious what Stefan, how Stefan feels about it. Yeah, consistently to what I've said a few minutes ago, I think if we distract the small team of engineers we have to do those tech transfer now, the impact on lives and the spread of virus in 2021 will be very large. And so uh, we are on track, you know, to get $1.4 billion next year. We are even considering now, do we even add more for next year? Because as we discussed, the variant is going to be a big issue next year. And I think some technologies won't be able to move as fast as mRNA. But every resource we take out of the, the plan now, the current plan, will impact our ability to get doses out this year. We mean the virus will spread more and have more risk of new variants. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Michelle, a question from Associated Press. What can your groups do to get more vaccines to low and min middle income countries? There's much to do and much is underway. I think we have to support um, the great pipelines that have been set up. As I said, you know, COVAX did not start with the great momentum that it should have because it didn't have full support of all of um, the developing co developed countries. Now that the US is on board in collaboration with Europe, it is getting fully funded and it is getting up to speed and delivering you know, free doses to developing countries. This is incredibly important and we should not disrupt that because that is the fastest way, the fastest way to get high quality um, doses delivered to these countries. And that speed is so critically important as we've seen um, this week in India. I think it's also important to focus on how difficult this tech transfer has been. You know, many in the U.S. have seen stories in the recent weeks about collaborations just within the U.S. where manufacturing has broken down, even when you have two very closely collaborating partners um, within the U.S. It is so complex to get this right, and we don't want to do anything that undermines vaccine confidence because we need everyone to feel confident in the global supply of vaccines and to get doses when they become available to them. And then finally, I think the US has to take a really hard look at themselves and say, if we have excess doses, 
um, if we have the ability to lift the Defense Produ Production Act and deliver raw materials more quickly globally, then we need to take those steps to make sure we are supporting the global manufacturing capacity that is currently in place. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Um, Stefan, a question here from uh, Tam Media in Switzerland. It's a group of uh, Swiss German uh, newspapers, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they say, we heard that Moderna would not be happy with its production partner, Lonza, which would not be able to tackle shortages of qualified personnel. Uh, can you confirm this? Um, I think that that's more, they're asking you, um, are you happy with your partner, uh, Lonza, um, and uh, if they can't uh, tackle a shortage of qualified personnel? Yes, so first let me say yes, we are very happy and thankful to the partnership with Lonza, not only uh, in the US, but also uh, in Europe, in Switzerland. Uh, we've had indeed uh, some delays in hiring of people in Lonza. I know the teams are working really hard to close that gap and to make sure we can maximize every dose that we can make. Uh, this is why there has been uh, in some countries uh, a little bit of delays in the last week or two. Uh, the team is working really hard at Lonza to move personnel from other products at the, the VISP site in Lonza. They are also hiring. They have also reached out to other pharmaceutical companies for help, including companies on this panel. We have also reached out to companies outside of pharmaceuticals that have operators to potentially have them transferred uh, and trained in the GMPs so we can make the product. So, uh, you know, to make a product, you need clean rooms, you need, you need material, raw materials, you need machines, and you need people. And until you have those four things, you know, you're trying to get to the right stage. And at this stage, you know, we have great clean rooms at Lonza. We have been able to secure the right raw materials. The equipment have all been installed and validated and are all functional, all the different lines of manufacturing. Uh, the bottleneck now, there's always a bottleneck somewhere, as my manufacturing colleagues know. The bottleneck right now is people. Uh, but I'm confident that the Lonza team is very focused on it and it should be closed uh, in terms of gaps soon. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Sai, there's a question from the Indian Express. Uh, vaccine manufacturers outside the USA have been raising the issue of shortage of raw materials. So how is this issue being addressed? I think, I think we discussed this already. Uh, this is a very serious issue and it is going to hamper uh, available capacities. And what happens in vaccine manufacturing is that it's a long-term and a, cy a cyclical process, meaning uh, a batch from start to finish could take anywhere from 60 to 180 days, depending on the product and depending on the company and depending on the QC testing involved. So if there is any shortage of supplies, in any stage of vaccine manufacturing, the impact would be very severe three months or four months down the line. I think there is a lot of discussions between countries at the diplomatic level. I think that's already ongoing. And I think there is also the discussion between companies. I mean, our own suppliers from US and Europe, we speak to them on a daily or a weekly basis. I'm pretty sure other members of our network are doing the same. So there is no easy answers. I mean, there is, we just cannot, even a simple raw material that we are getting from the United States or a single use plastic bag or a filter that for example, we get from US or Europe or China, for example, there is no way that we could get that technology, even set it up and get it manufactured anywhere else. So we really have to depend on these companies that we have established long-term partnerships with and the countries to enable these free flow of goods between uh, the, where the manufacturing is happening and where the, I mean, the manufacturing of these materials are happening and where vaccine manufacturing is happening. And look at the flip side. If every country takes a similar stance saying that whatever we make in our country stays within the country, then I don't think we're going to be uh, any way closer to getting out of this pandemic. And uh, we all started with the premise uh, more than 12 months ago uh, about simple terms like leaving no one behind and none of us are safe until everybody is safe. So I don't think any country can think that they can just protect their population 
uh, just by these kinds of concepts or um, laws and not expect the virus to come back into their country again. And I think we are seeing this in waves and waves of the pandemic also. I think policymakers and lawmakers around the world need to think about this, take, to have to take a serious look about this. And, uh, you know, uh, I would request better and cooler heads to prevail. Over. Thank you. There's a question here, Roger, from the BBC. Um, how difficult is it to manage vaccine supply across the world when many countries are at different stages in the fight against the virus? Should supply be diverted from developed nations like the UK in response to crisis in other parts of the world? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I, I, I do believe that at, at, at some stage that diversion of excess doses is going to be an, an important uh, contributor. I, I think as other people on, on the panel have said, we've got to stay focused on the current goal, which is continuing to create as many, many doses as possible. I do think this is where the COVAX facility can play a really important part as, as well. As I mentioned, it's off to a good start, but I think there's more that we can continue to do to support it and ensure that through further collaboration, the facility continues to get more doses. I think when you look at some of the, the, uh, the countries in the developed world who have done their own deals with, with, with companies and have bought, let's say, volume above their population requirement, there will be excess doses available. And I do believe that as those are diverted and go into the likes of the COVAX facility, that's when they really can make a difference. Okay, thank you. Um, Le Temps, which is a Swiss-French uh, newspaper, Roger, is just asking for clarification. It's saying, is it not possible to ramp up production to serve the global community? And they're also saying, can you consider COVAX as a success story while it has so far distributed 40 million doses? So, so I, I, I think to the first point or, or around ramp up of the global supply chain, that is exactly what we are looking to do. Um, there, is, there is a constraint, which is the number of transfers that all of the companies involved in these vaccine development programs can actually do. But the collaboration that we have, I think, is very strong, looking for those win-win partnerships where you can identify capacity and then use it. Even within GSK, where we had a delay to our own vaccine and capacity sitting ready to go, what we did was we went out and talked to so many, many of the, the manufacturers of the vaccines that were first to market and say, well, can we now use our spare capacity to help you? That, that sort of behavior is the sort of thing that we're seeing across the world and, and we need to continue to, to do. On COVAX and its, and its success versus the previous pandemic, I tell you, COVAX is a real step forward. Is it good enough? No, it's not good enough at the moment. As I said, it's got to continue to be supported both at a government level, but then also from companies and from governments. As I mentioned, I do believe excess doses from the developed world going into COVAX would be a big step forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thomas, a follow-up from LECO in Belgium. Uh, you mentioned shortages of skilled workers in in the vaccine industry. Do you have an estimate of this shortage at the global level? No. That's potentially one for Airfinity uh, or statistics uh, to look in, in, into. Um, let me also put a question to Stefan from Health Policy Watch. Will Moderna, which has a more temperature robust vaccine than Pfizer, uh, join COVAX? Yes, so we are working with COVAX. We have been in discussions with them uh, for quite a while now. We have also answered the tender from UNICEF. As many people know, UNICEF uh, is the procurement arm of COVAX. Uh, because Moderna had never launched a vaccine, we had to go through a lot of qualification with UNICEF. Unlike other companies uh, that already are commercial, already have partnership with UNICEF. And I hope we're in the final stretch to get uh, an agreement with COVAX with a, a big commitment from Moderna, both for 2021 and 2022, including the current vaccine and uh, variants. Thank you very, very much. Um, at the moment, I think that we've dealt with all the journalist uh, questions. If one comes up, I will immediately ask you. But to conclude uh, today, I would like to go back to each of our spe uh, speakers. It was all about the challenges and solutions 
uh, to scaling up manufacturing of uh, vaccines. Um, we're most probably in the world of what we call sound bites, uh, very short answers or tweets. Uh, let me begin with uh, Michelle. Um, your takeaway message to the media today who are joining us. It's important that we stay the course and make sure that we solve this problem as quickly as possible, which means relying on international collaborations that are already begun, but have yet to reach their full potential. Thank you. Roger. I think collaboration is everything and this industry understands it and we're on it. Sai. Uh, if you had asked me a year ago that uh, we would have eight or nine vaccines and we would have manufactured more than a billion doses and supplied vaccines to more than 100 countries, I would have said, no way, no way. But it has happened. And I think by all means, what we have achieved as an industry, as a group of innovators and vaccine manufacturers is a great success. But... We have, the job is not done yet. We need to make sure that this success reaches every single person in the world and provide global access. I'm sorry, I couldn't give you a small statement, but I think that captures it. And I don't want to, I'm not happy hearing about doom and gloom saying that we've not done enough. I think we've done a lot. And I think we need to do more to get these vaccines to developing world. Over. Thank you. Rajinda. And if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for uh, unmuting me. Uh, global problems require global solutions. And I think all of us, including uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the press, have to collaborate together to help protect everyone and leave no one behind. Thank you. And Stefan. I think we have to stay the course. But there's still a lot of work to do but the industry has a great plan to deliver as many doses as we can in 21 with all the raw material issue, equipment issue, and so on. Focus on the variant for 22 uh, so that everyone in the world can be vaccinated by the end of 22 so we can put this virus uh, at bay and move forward with our life and uh, forget this nightmare that we are living through. Stefan, thank you very much. And let me give the last word to Thomas Kuini, who will wrap up this media briefing. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you to the journalists for your interest in this. I think when we look back on the one hand, and we have heard it a few times, we can be pretty proud of how far we have come. And we clearly are very different uh, on track from the HIV AIDS, where it took almost 10 years for antivirals to reach patients in sub-Saharan Africa, we are much more advanced. But having said that, I think we need to call out for more solidarity from the haves with the have-nots. We actually need to have more doses for COVAX in the next two months. I think it'd be disappointing if we continue to vaccinate 20-year-old or 16-year-old healthy kids for example, in the US, and no vaccines can leave the US uh, for COVAX before that time. I think we need to do better. And the same goes for the countries in Europe. The second element, I think we, you heard the shared concern about the bottlenecks, the scarcity, the raw materials. We do need to collaborate, not just among us, but also with the COVAX partners and WTO and maybe also the World Customs Organization to address the trade barriers, the export restrictions, but also from us as an industry, I think you heard the willingness to voluntarily commit to enhancing the visibility of supply and demand and to find out and find some matchmaking where we can increase the efficiencies of supply chain, but also I do believe that we will see more partnerships. I've been surprised how many we already have. We will see more, but I think already now, as Stefan and others talked about the variants, we may need our booster shots next year. I think we will need our booster shots next year, but already now we need to sit down and talk about the construct of future pandemic preparedness. And in that context, I would expect 
We will see much more talk also by technology transfer, by regional hubs. And what you hear from our colleagues from the developing country vaccine manufacturer network, from Bio and from IFPMA, I've never seen such a spirit of we are in the same boat. We are in this together. This is business not as usual. And we want really to make sure that we can overcome the pandemic fatigue because I don't know anybody in my family, in my company, in my environment, not really keen to get out of this pandemic, out of the lockdowns sooner rather than later. Thanks to Stefan and others, I think we see light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very, very much, Thomas. Thank you to our other speakers who've been joining us from all over the world. And and to the journalists for their very informed questions. Uh, you will be seeing this video very shortly on the IFPMA website, www.ifpma.org. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. Stay well and safe.